going to open up the floor uh, for question and answer. So uh, if you have a qu any questions, just raise your hand, and we can send you a mat. Is it on? Okay. Um, this is for Professor Toms. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, specifically what, I don't want to pull language and literature apart too far, but what kind of second language acquisition affordances or development or um, um, promotion you, th you thought or that you saw um, was coming from this kind of activity? Um, yeah, that's a good question uh, in terms of uh, the spirit of the, of the project was um, first and foremost to kind of first identify what an affordance might look like. And so we didn't necessarily have the goal of actually tying that to any sort of development per se, long, both in the short term, maybe in the context of the reading, <clears throat> and long, longer term in terms of if they're going to pick it up within this digital space and then later on acquiring, for example, knowledge about the rhetorical devices that they were using or learning about in the course or uh, understanding the reading comprehension. Um, <clears throat> so with respect to sort of the theoretical piece of it, it was first and foremost to A, identify what it might look like in, in the course of, of, uh, of this digital space and the environment. Um, I do think the next step, obviously, is to <laughs> try to look at the linkage then of a here's what's happening in the digital space here's the here's a literary affordance that was happening with a particular student and, and or linguistic and then somehow tying that to either again a short term sort of learning uh, outcome whether they're learning a particular grammatical or lexical feature or <clears throat> again some sort of literary sort of understanding or terminology both in the short term and the long term and so I think with respect to uh, this type of study it sort of this is, you know, it merits further investigation, surely. Um, and so the, the main spirit, the, the main point or goal, I guess, of the, of the project was to first have a, a, an empirical definition because a lot of times I see affordance thrown around or used in conferences and in, in literature uh, related to call <clears throat> without any sort of specificity. I think it makes sense uh, on a theoretical level, but until we can actually empirically define what it is and what it might look like in the context of of discourse, however we wanted to define that, um, <clears throat> it's only then when we can sort of advance our understanding of how this might affect SLA. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Um, I actually have a question for each of you, but I, I won't do that. Um, and I'll start with you, Jill, because uh, these guys are, are sitting here. By the way, it's nice to see you. Yeah, I wish you were co-present with us. We miss you. Um, and I happen to be sitting right next to Kathy Harris, um, and so, yeah, yeah, she's waving too. Um, so while you were presenting your project and you were describing the ways in which language and particularly the bilingual presentation of materials, including two varieties or two uh, registers really of English, sort of a more simplified and then a, a more full complex or whatever variety of some of those materials, it got me thinking about some of the stuff um, that Joshua was describing, like the CMU heat map um, uh, annotation tool what I would like to know about your study, Jill, especially with disenfranchised, less supported um, uh, uh, communities, building basic literacy as adults, what kinds of things do they say is most helpful about those various texts? I mean, discrete lexical items or collocational patterns or paragraphs uh, that they can actually mark and tag themselves. And if you have 10,000 users, you could have a hell of a heat map that might show you some very interesting features to the precise kinds of affordances. I'm using the term generally, Joshua, so you often. Um, that, 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 that those texts are valuable for them across languages or whatever, maybe also an annotation for problematic issues, things that need clarification, um, things that don't align between the quote-unquote translations or interpretations of the quote-unquote same text but in different languages. But it would be really cool, and also the social reading part in general. And I know from what I understand of you and your work, you do a lot of social activities around literacy and reading and the public externalized 
uh, uh, you know, vocalized aspect to reading. But I think that would be a potentially very powerful pedagogical component, especially to adults who might feel somewhat isolated by limited literacy abilities. So tools to help better understand what LearnerWeb and your site does, one with the annotation, maybe the CMU heat tracker tool, and then the social reading part of it more generally as a pedagogical soft mod for the kinds of materials that you already have available to see if that makes outcomes better. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> I agree with everything you said, Steve. Um, I think there's a lot of synergy between these three studies in that um, we're thinking a lot about the social environment, we're thinking a lot about the affordances of technology and the role of collaboration. And I think that the, one of the most powerful driving forces is that internet technologies and the ways in which we utilize those affordances really bring up new ways to collaborate. There's face-to-face -face collaboration, there's collaboration through these annotation tools, there's collaboration through the social media, and through and across all of those different modes and means, there's, there's uh, so many more potentials for um, interactions to be deepened and to be used in purposeful ways to, to learn basic digital literacy skills, to read deeper into text and be able to share insights. And so I really thank you for um, pointing out those synergies across the studies because I was seeing some of that as well. Thanks, Jill. Hi, Jill. This is David. Good to see you. Hi, David. There we go. Um, you know, in it, as an old California surfer, you know, in addition to trying to avoid hurricanes, you also sometimes can avoid riptides, powerful forces that sweep you out to sea and you're out there 100 miles and you go, what the hell, how did I get out here? And I feel like that after listening to the three of you, that I'm suddenly swept out to sea and thinking, man, I really have to do some changes. Um, I'm struck by the empirical support for how collaboration deepens um, word usage, how it deepens thought, how it, you know, how it, um, you know, empirically can be shown that it increases language in so many different ways. And um, just kind of reflecting personally on my university teaching, most of my assignments are individual. I mean, I have lots of group stuff in class, but when it comes down to grading, you know, it's, it's awful, you know, and it doesn't tap into students' funds of knowledge or doesn't tap into the zone of proximal development, doesn't tap into the potentiality of, of learning. And clearly, from the corpus linguistics point of view, from your view with social reading, I mean, collaboration is a powerful, powerful tool. And why would it not be, I mean, you know, in terms of the social interaction? So, you know, maybe one comment is, is that, you know, even though there are disadvantages, as all of you pointed out, is that the advantages are you know, of much more value. They're more value added. So have you found ways in all of your work to mute um, or attenuate some of the disadvantages and bring out the advantages of the collaboration that, you know, you see in each one of the, the studies that you've done? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. I mean, we're, we're looking now a lot more at what goes on during collaboration and not just um, during writing and not just from a point of view of how much talk is produced, but what they're talking about. Because some of the earlier uh, approaches and some of the earlier ways we analyzed the data, there, there was equal amount of talk across a dyad. But one person wasn't really contributing. They were repeating. Um, they were asking, you know, sort of procedural questions. And so what we're trying to do now is, is really understand the functions of the talk and what each person's relative contribution is to that. Um, and the other issue, I think, is, is who, who decides who your partner is, whether it's self-selection um, or whether they're assigned or whether you're doing it with a high-level learner or a low-level learner, 
and I have a PhD student now who's looking at, um, she did two collaborative tasks, but one was when they collaborated in their, in their native language, which was Chinese, um, and then they also collaborated in English and wrote two different essays, and so she's kind of looking at, because there's a lot of evidence that would suggest that if, even if you collaborate in a shared native language, you might have a deeper type of communicative uh, episodes that could facilitate writing development too. So we don't really know yet, or at least I don't, but I think there's definitely ways of finding it out. Um, in terms of social reading goes, um, you know, we certainly learned some lessons in terms of providing students with deadlines. I referenced another study in Chinese that we were looking at, that we looked at, and um, we learned a big lesson in terms of giving students a, time, uh, a timeline in terms of staggering out their, the, the time in which they are actually commenting in that particular study. I mean, a lot, about 90% of the students were waiting until the last day to actually go in, and so the sort of iterative, kind of collaborative nature became sort of uh, yet another type of assignment to get done, and so what we expected there uh, versus what, uh, what actually happened was a lesson that we learned, and so we changed things up for this other, this other study in the Spanish, um, the Spanish language context. Um, and I should just, um, wanted to also make a note here about Again, sort of this idea of, of language versus literature, folks. Um, I think that, in, in my case, at least in my department, this particular uh, literature person was very receptive to um, uh, incorporating technology. At lunch, we were talking, John Reinhardt up there, we were talking a little bit about uh, sometimes in our um, sort of own sort of communities of literature versus language, this idea of of why, you know, of technology, we're being, we are immersed in technology, the question that you had, Heather, before, that sometimes literature folks are kind of resistant to technology, that, that print is sort of um, preferred, um, but as we go about sort of introducing these technologies, at least in, in my experience, uh, the literature folks actually appreciated that, so in terms of kind of mitigating that divide between language and literature, I've uh, had a, a positive experience, so <clears throat> just wanted to mention that. Hello. Oh, hi, Jill. This is Chantal Warner. Thank you all three of you for your talks. Um, my question is about because we've we've talked and, and a number of you have highlighted the potential. I'm going to go with affordances cautiously of uh, technology. But one of the things that struck me between the three talks, as well as the ways in which um, bringing technology in, sometimes highlights aspects of language that we sometimes don't pay enough attention to. So I, I saw that uh, Joshua in the focus on the poetic and interpersonal aspects of the social and um, literary affordances. And then in uh, Bill's talk with the fillers and maybe that reminder that complexity, sometimes how we think about complexity isn't the only way to think about complexity or, or what's going on in the composition of texts. And then Jill in yours in the ways in which multilingualism was acting as a sort of layered support, as you called it. So I wondered if you could comment, um, any of you, about the ways in which the technology um, as a researcher or as a person who uh, researches um, education and as an educator kind of shifted your attention in various ways on aspects of language or language use that maybe weren't where your head would necessarily go in the first place. Well, I can answer quickly. Um, one of the things, so as, as you heard me talk about this idea of variation between the texts leaves open this concept of complexity. And there's a, there's a large, as m most of you probably know, a large body of uh, uh, disparate kinds of perspectives on what complexity means. Does it mean length? Is it, is it typological? Um, from a, from a, a uh, technology perspective, one way that is fairly promising, I don't know if have any of you heard of this idea of Komolgorov complexity or information theoretic complexity. Uh, there's a recent paper coming out by Benedict Smaransky and a colleague, um, and what they do is if you get enough text together, you can zip file them, and the amount of 
algorithms that you use to compress the text can be different, which, which, which then suggests that one group of texts is more complex than another. And they've showed this with, for instance, simplified versions of the Bible versus Wycliffe's version. This latest study looks at different kinds of L2 versions. Um, so it's just this completely atheoretical information theoretic model of complexity. Um, the problem is they haven't quite figured out how to unpack the, uh, <laughs> the output, but there are some promising ways of actually doing it. So you can actually zip two corpora together and the one that takes um, more, uh, more basically memory is the one that's more complex. So I think it has some possibility, um, but it hasn't quite been pulled out lately. So. I use pronouns almost every day. Um, so, you know, it isn't about being against pronouns or against oral uh, genres or registers, uh, as, as you would describe it, in, 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 uh, in, in general. But within academic context, I think that, that outcome in terms of explaining it is kind of twofold. At a more basic level, it's a built-in editorial process. So people are writing and revising and writing and revising, and you have this triangulation minimally. I think you said it was dyads or triads? Three? Dyads, yeah. Dyads. So you have this back and forth and back and forth, and you know someone else looks at your text, and you look at what they do, and then you can objectify it and see it from a more distant vantage point and, and make those, if you will, um, uh, up-register moves that uh, move it toward academic discourse styles. So that's one side. The other side is, uh, we fetishize individual assessment in the academy, right? Jill, I loved that you mentioned in your project, you're not even thinking about individual brains getting better. You're all at the group or the community level. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying we should necessarily disattend individual differences, as David had a very good question about that this morning, or individual development, but this idea of looking at the power of the collective intelligence and empirically demonstrating that in extreme linguistic detail was something that I found very profound in your presentation today. But I didn't hear you say any of that. I didn't hear you talk about editorial process or about the collective intelligence that might be manifest when two people are working on this. So in essence, they create maybe more of an expert speaker when there are two, right? Which I think demonstrates a, pedagogically a very powerful message for doing this more, and maybe even looking at that as a reasonable unit of analysis for grading and for moving them forward. I mean, it's not what you can do by yourself most of the time in the workplace, it's what you can do with other people, you know? And sometimes if you can't do stuff with other people, even if you're really good at it by doing it alone, you're not helping mm -hmm. the larger enterprise. And most of us are involved in something bigger than ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I, I found that to be a potentially, um, something that could, could benefit from like in the discussion section of a paper that might come out of that or whatever that, I mean, that's a, I think a beautiful set and an important set of comments that might be worth thinking about. I don't know. What do you think? Um, well, first off, I'd say that the adjective profound is rarely used in relation to anything I do. But, um, <laughs> but I'd say my interest in, in collaborative writing at least the way I think about it is ultimately you have to be able to show that it is helping the individual because that's the unless we can change the educational context that's pretty much but see that you're I mean your day you're you're careful you know I mean you know scientific analysis mm -hmm. of the linguistic assets utilized and under those two conditions holding constant task and all right, that right. I mean that's the kind of message that maybe teachers, but potentially even later institutions, would say, okay, so maybe there will have an individual assessment component, but maybe part of being an excellent academic or you know, a, a BA in sociology or anthropology or whatever, would be able to collaborate with someone and produce that kind of text, not the, the 
you know, uh, pronoun filled individually right. produced text, but you would want to be able to produce those kinds of texts, and you would want to be the kind of person who could learn how to collaboratively do that as a marker of your individual development, as well as your capacity to collectively produce much more than you can alone, and that could potentially, eventually, over decades, subvert this fetishization of the individual and individualized assessment, which I don't find always necessary and certainly not always helpful. Well, the, the emerging collaborative writing research is really starting to look more not, the early research has done mostly things that are not, uh, I think, authentic writing tasks. They use like jigsaw yeah. sort of things, information gap, and they look at LREs and how many LREs are correctly resolved and all that. So this kind of research, which is actually looking at real writing and the, and the um, not just the linguistic features that are associated with it, but the quality of the writing as assessed by, uh, by a rubric, for instance. And the, the real interest in this is with, in contexts that are traditionally EFL, with teachers that traditionally are teaching writing courses, which writing to learn language sorts of courses, with 40 or 50 students in it, because you have half the essays to grade, right? So if you can show that it's actually facilitating in some way, it, it, uh, it, it can encourage curriculum uh, program administrators and curriculum developers to use it. So, yeah, yeah I agree. I just sort of grabbed the mic here. Um, the individual and collaborative communication and the whole sort of question of how that is graded, marked, credentialed, and so on and so forth interests me very, very much. But it doesn't interest policymakers nearly as much as it interests me and interests everybody here. And that, for me, has been a real bugbear. Because I think if we take a look at how, how people communicate in the world outside of any kind of walls, and a lot of education doesn't have walls around it anyhow. There's so much education in different sort of ways and forms. Then there's very little of it that's actually the the individual, and the, even with the Nobel Prizes that they are handing out, right, I think they started last week, you know, the first thing people say is, well, thank you for the Nobel Prize, but, you know, actually there's this great laundry list of people who helped me get to this new something or other that, you know, they have rewarded me for. But, I mean, it's a huge problem. There's another aspect of it, too, I think, and that's with um, in communication multimodally. How much are you looking at that's stuck on a page? And how much are you looking at that comes in through other kinds of communicative media? And how do you start to factor that into the process? I don't actually think it's a fair question, but I, that's where I'm going to leave it. Hmm. Yeah, I'm definitely ripe for analysis. So, I mean, this might be completely off the mark, but um, I think one of the threads that we've been talking about since uh, Steve started talking this morning is the, I don't know, I want to say the permeability, the maybe the disappearance, the blending into the individual, uh, the blending into the technology of the individual, the fact that with these new relatively new and powerful technologies, the boundaries between individuals and uh, the rest of the world are being brought into a different relationship. Um, and I think it was Gregory Bateson who said the great problem with evolutionary theory is it studies the individual unit or the family or the clad or something, but it doesn't study the individual plus the environment and that that should be the unit of analysis. Um, we use language sometimes to talk to ourselves. For some scholars, that's a very important. Uh, um, but it's even then, it's a kind of social talking. I mean, ultimately, we use language, um, except in schools, to do things to get something done in the world, which is filled with other people and other social objects. So, you know, without saying there's no such thing as individual communicative competence, I do think one of the things we're pushing at uh, and, and this, you know, digital technologies allow us to do this. There are, there are many things, but a tool to allow us to think about how we are uh, not simply within ourselves and how, uh, well, the ecological approach is everything is tied up 
with everything else uh, fundamentally. Um, I'm not in this area, I'm just giving a crazy comment, but. Just let me say one thing. You know, you mentioned the Kamolgorov algorithm. I mean, that, that really reflects, you know, kind of a Bertolanffy's a systems approach that's been followed, you know. So, you know, when you look at language learning in that respect, it really does go back to a formulaic bent because those types of complexities are deeply rule-based. And I think even, you know, Dwight's comment about, you know, Bateson is that, I mean, one of the things that the social sciences struggles with is finding out the deep rule system of human learning, the deep rule system. So we are actually, you know, sophistication and complexity and it's not complicated. I mean, I've tried to draw fractal images basically of parents and children reading stories. And, you know, because the, you know, one of the theories of state space construction is if you come up with any recognizable pattern, then you have a rule system, you have a talk that's productive and generative. You know, so I mean, one thing to think about, and maybe this is a bias, and I don't, I don't mean to sound Chomskyan, but I think in language learning, there is a deep, deep, deep rule system that we're all trying to discover, and discovering that brings us a little bit closer in how to develop good pedagogy and learning and so forth. Well, mine's, I liked where David took this, so I'm, I, I apologize for taking us back to where I was at with Steve a little while ago. The, Jill found, what I want to say is that tied in with these tensions and conflicts that we have over the individual and curriculum and instruction and policy, a related idea for me in my world of language and literacy teaching and of teachers teaching teachers and tutors about language and literacy in that world i find continuously what jill found and was alluded to a little bit by the other panel speakers too of this deficit orientation toward teaching and learning and one of the things that I would, would welcome advice on or would like to know how to study would be how to help teachers and tutors grow out of that deficit model and see more of a generative growth model to learning. And I just would like anybody's comments on that. Here, here, Patty. I'm just so glad that you brought up that point. I think um, the more that we provide training around language development and the literacy processes to tutors, the more that we could overcome this deficit view. And I know that that turns that whole responsibility back to us as educators to provide more training. But I truly think that the more an individual understands about language development and literacy development as intertwined, we can push up against that deficit view and begin to start to, to think differently about the ways these learning interactions can occur. But um, I'm glad that, that we see synergy in some of the same ways um, in your work and mine, because I think that's a really important point to be made and brought forward. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, we've got to, our time is up. We've got to move on to our keynote. Coffee. Coffee. Oh, coffee. Okay. <laughs> See, I need coffee. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you.